Brethren, we are continuing in our study series on the Ten Commandments, and so I'll start with a quiz. Does anybody know where we find the Ten Commandments? Okay. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5, well done. So we'll start in Deuteronomy 5 and verse 16. Honor your father and your mother, as Jehovah your mighty one has commanded you, that your days may be long, and that it may be well with you in the land in which Jehovah your mighty one is giving you. So this, brethren, is the fifth commandment. And if you remember when we first started this series, I explained the structure of the Ten Commandments. The, the first four commandments define our relationship with Jehovah, with the mighty one. The fifth commandment is a transitional commandment. It transition, transitions the thought from our adoration and our worship of Jehovah to our physical relationship with other human beings. Six, seven, eight, and nine define our relationship with other human beings. And number 10 is again a, tradition, a transitional commandment, changing the thought from what we do to what we think and we'll explain that in more detail when we come to that commandment but for today we are looking at the fifth commandment and as I said it's a transitional commandment so it has two applications and as we just read in that scripture honor thy father and thy mother as Jehovah thy mighty one hath commanded thee that thy days may be prolonged and that it may go well with thee in the land which Jehovah thy mighty one giveth thee so we see the requirement here that we are to honor our father and our mother and also that this commandment has embedded in it a blessing if we honor our father and our mother then we will have prolonged life we will have uh, extended time on this earth we will have time in the land to enjoy the blessings that Jehovah has given us so let's study this commandment in more detail and let us understand each of those elements so please start by turning to Leviticus chapter 19 and we'll start in verse 1. Leviticus 19 starting in verse 1. And Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the children, all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be set apart, for I, Jehovah your mighty one, am set apart. Every one of you shall revere his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am Jehovah, your mighty one. Do not turn to idols, nor make for yourself molded gods, for I am Jehovah, your mighty one. And if you offer a sacrifice of a peace offering to Jehovah, you shall offer it of your own free will. It shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the next day, and if any remains until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. And if it is eaten at all on the third day, it is an abomination, it shall not be accepted. Therefore everyone who eats it shall bear his iniquity, because he has profaned the hallowed offering of Jehovah, and that person shall be cut off from his people. So in this scripture, in verse 3, we see this. Ye shall fear every man his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am Jehovah your mighty one. And in the New King James, that word for fear is revere. So we are instructed again in the book of Leviticus to revere our mothers and our fathers. And you can see that this, this instruction is tied in with the Sabbath commandment. It says, and keep my Sabbaths. Jehovah regards our respect for our parents just as highly as he requires observance of the Sabbath day. This is an essential part of the plan of Jehovah. The seventh day Sabbath is a sign between him and his people. It sets us apart. The relationship we have with our parents is an essential element of the, the Israelite community. The Israelite community was based on the family unit, based on the clans and the tribes. And so without that fundamental building block of a strong, respectful and supportive family, the foundation of Israelite society was at risk. And as we see in our society today, where divorce is common, where um, there are people who have multiple children, uh, there are some, some women we know who've had uh, 
several different husbands, a child by each husband, the woman's on her own with multiple children, and, and these men are off doing their own thing. But there is no family unit, there is no cohesion, there is no support, there is no infrastructure for the family. And this is very damaging for the children, this is very damaging for the family, and it is very damaging for our society. And we can see that since the concept of no-fault divorce, divorce rates have rocketed. I think 50% of all marriages now end in divorce. And I think I read a statistic recently that less than half of all the children born in America are actually born inside a traditional marriage. So we can see that our, the fundamental building block of our society is unraveling, and it has unraveled as much as anything because we have not upheld this commandment, the, the requirement to have respectful families and respectful relationships in our families. And if you look at the TV, if you look at modern uh, supposed entertainment, you see how little respect children have for their parents, how how the, uh, the, the child is um, elevated to a status, uh, it's what they call the cult of youth, how youth and indifference and um, indolence even is, is promoted in our society contrary to the typical norms of a stable, respectful, productive, law-abiding and uh, useful family unit. So we can see that by letting go of this commandment we have caused all sorts of problems within our society. But we are told to revere, to honour, to respect our mother and our father. And just to give you an idea of how important Jehovah regards this, let's turn forward just one page to Leviticus 20. And let us start in verse 1. Leviticus 20, and we'll start in verse 1. Then Jehovah spoke to Moses, saying, Again you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or the strangers who dwell in Israel, and gives any of descendants to Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people, because he has given some of his descendants to Molech, to defile my sanctuary and to profane my set-apart name. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Moloch, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off from his people and all who prostitute themselves with him, to commit harlotry with Molech. And the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person, and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be set apart, for I am Yahweh, your mighty one. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them, and I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. For everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. So verse 9 tells us this. For every one that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother. His blood shall be upon him. Now that seems like an extraordinarily, extraordinarily harsh punishment when we look at the uh, the disrespect we have in our society, when we, have, when, we, when we look at how intrusive the state has become into family lives. When, you look, when we lived in Canada, there was a story of a, of a man who was arrested by the Ontario police because he spanked his child in public. Um, and what, they, what the media failed to report was that this child had just slammed the car door on his sibling's hand and crushed their fingers. And so the father was, was protecting his family by administering discipline to this, this unruly child. The father was arrested and actually ended up being taken to court for child abuse. And this, this whole concept, the scriptures say, spare the rod and, and spoil the child. Corporal punishment is part of the family process, is part of the parenting process. Now, it should not be done to excess. It should not be done in in indifference to uh, correct communication, but it is still an element of the family unit, of the family process. And by taking that away from parents, they are, they are hamstrung and they are not able to raise their children appropriately. And this causes the problems that we see. And if you look at how 
families can be undermined when the children are in dis ill disciplined when the children are disrespectful the parents are overwhelmed the parents have difficulty just keeping going they have difficulty maintaining themselves and eventually the children go astray and there's a f for every for every human uh, decision there is what's called the law of unintended consequence and if we see along with the failure of our society to protect the family unit along with the, the failure of our society to protect marriage and to protect the, the, the parents we also see a failure of our society to protect children since since Roe versus Wade in America 50 million children have been executed through the the industry of abortion that's more children executed in this country than the total number of military personnel who have ever died in the history of this nation and Yehovah is a, is, a, is a mighty one of life, he is a mighty one of creation and we will be punished as a nation for executing our children and it's interesting that the scripture that says uh, the child who disrespects mother or father shall be put to death is in the same paragraphs, in the same clause as the admonition against Molech. Molech was obviously the, the Canaanite god and Molech required infant sacrifice as part of his sacrament. And so as we have done away with protecting the family unit, protecting the parents, we have also lost the, the right and the desire to protect the children, especially the weakest of our children, those who are not yet born. So we can see that when we throw away the commandments, we open up all sorts of unintended consequence to the detriment of all society. So let's continue and let's look at another aspect of this. Let's turn forward to Deuteronomy 27. And we will start in verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 27. And we will start in verse 9. Then Moses and the priests, the Levites, spoke to all Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you have become the people of Jehovah your mighty one. Therefore you shall obey the voice of Jehovah your mighty one, and observe his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people when you have crossed over the Jordan, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to Jehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen. So in this situation in Israel where they went through this process of declaring as a nation the blessings and curses which Jehovah had laid before them, we're told in verse 16, Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt, and all the people shall say, Amen. So we see that by giving up our family unit, by forsaking this requirement to instill discipline in our children, we have undermined the family unit and we have brought a curse upon ourselves. We brought a curse upon this nation, and we brought a curse upon our parents, we brought a curse upon our children, and this curse will be played out during the time of the end when Jehovah comes to meet out justice on all the world. But again, we need to understand, if we would do what Jehovah tells us to do, we would be blessed. But because we have gone our own way, because we have tried to live outside of his law, outside of his Torah, outside of his commandments, we have brought curses on ourselves as a people, we've brought curses on ourselves as parents, and we have brought curses on our children. And this is the, this is the problem we have when we, when we think we know better than Jehovah, we open up all sorts of unintended and unexpected consequences which come back to haunt us. Let's turn forward to Proverbs chapter 1 and let us understand, or let us try to understand why this commandment has in it 
the implicit blessing that it brings to the, to the people. So Proverbs 1, and we'll start in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the word of the wise and their riddles. The fear of Yehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a, gracious orn a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. So, in this proverb we're told in verse 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. So here we're seeing the wisdom of Solomon. He was laying this down for his son to learn the lessons. And I've always said to my children, try and learn from the mistakes that I've made. Try and learn from the lessons that I've learned. By all means, go out and make your own mistakes, but don't repeat the ones I've made. Make new mistakes, learn new things, push forward the understanding of human experience, push forward your own experience, but don't do the same stupid things that I did. Learn from my mistakes, and then feel free to go out and make your own. And if we think about it, it says, the instruction of thy father and the law of thy mother. And immediately before that, in verse 7, we're told this, the fear of Yehovah is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And if people had a fear, had a respect, had an awe for the Torah, for the word of Yehovah, if they truly understood the blessing, that the, the wisdom that Scripture gives us, the fear of Yehovah, the desire to be obedient to his commandments would bring great blessings on us. But as it says, fools despise wisdom and instruction, and we have a foolish nation. We have a foolish society that has turned away from the Torah, has turned away from the commandments, and it's now making up laws which are situationally based there for the good of those who make the laws, not for the good of the people who should be protected by the laws. And we see that we are, we are being... Uh, cast adrift. We, are, we no longer can trust our government to protect us. We can no longer trust our society to protect us. And because we have let go of this foundational bedrock of the Ten Commandments, everything now is negotiable. And there is nothing sacred. There is nothing to protect us. There is nothing sacrosanct that we as a people can hold fast to. But if we had honoured our father and our mother, and if we had listened to them and listened to the wisdom of the elders saying you must have a, a legal system which is separate from a, the administration, which is separate from the executive branch, that would have protected the people. But because we have thought that we can do better doing it our way, Yehovah is letting us go down this path of foolishness and we will ultimately come to the end state, which is the destruction of our people and our nation. So just as we look at the, the impending doom of this nation, so Yehoshua gave the same condemnation to the children of Israel, to the children of Judah some 2,000 years ago. So let's turn into the New Testament and let us go to Matthew chapter 15 and let us understand the admonition that Ye Yehoshua gave to the people of his time in the first century AD. Matthew 15, and we'll start in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Yehoshua, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of the Mighty One because of your trans tradition? For the Mighty One commanded, saying, Honour your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to the Mighty One, then he need not honour his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of the Mighty One to no effect by your tradition. 
Hypocrite! Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So, just as we have discussed the problems in our society, Yehoshua faced exactly the same in the society in Judea when he walked on this earth. And in verses 5 and 6 he tells us this, But ye say, Whoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest have profited by me, and honour not his father or mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of the Mighty One of none effect by your tra tradition. So we see here that even in the time of the Pharisees and the scribes, the, the concept of uh, leaving the children the responsibility of, of providing for their parents, of looking after their parents, was, was in vogue in that society, that the Jewish, the rabbinic traditions, the Pharisaic traditions were used to uh, obviate the requirement to hold the family sacred, to protect mother and father, to provide to the elders in our community. And we see that in our society now. We see with the, uh, certainly in the UK, with the welfare state and the, the, uh, the, the way society, the nucleic family has, has disintegrated, how many elderly parents are shipped off to nursing homes and to, to places like that just to basically be parked until they die. Um, and with the breakdown of the nucleic family, that is the common course of action for most people. And it is, it is distressing because when we see that, it sets a precedent for future generations that human life actually becomes disposable. And we see a, a growing movement in Europe especially um, for euthanasia. And at the moment, the euthanasia is allegedly or supposedly voluntary, but there will come a time when it will be inconvenient for governments to keep all these elderly people parked in nursing homes and that uh, currently we have a, a thing called a, uh, a DNR notice, a do not resuscitate, but there will, be, there will be more active proposals coming down the future where when, a, when the life of an individual is considered to be economically worthless, that they will actively pursue a, a case of euthanasia. And that is a direct result of not honouring our father and our mother. And we see that this, uh, this statement here refers straight back to the book of Proverbs, to the wisdom of the scripture. And in Proverbs 28 and 24 it says, Whoso robbeth his father or his mother, and saith it is no transgression, the same is a companion of a destroyer. So we can see that Jehovah was warning the children of Israel right back in the, in the time of King Solomon and King David about the sanctity of the family unit, about the danger of letting that family unit disintegrate. We see Yehoshua reiterate that statement when he walked on the earth, and we see the, the result of us forsaking that commandment manifesting in our society today. But to demand respect is not what parenthood is about. Respect is a two-way street. And when I was a naval officer, I had gold bars on my shoulder. So I had legitimate authority because of my rank. But that only took you so far. To really be effective, you had to earn respect. You had to earn the, the trust of the men who were working under you. And as I said, the, the respect and the uh, the effectiveness of authority is a two-way street. Loyalty has to be earned, it has to be deserved, and it has to be given to the people who you look after. And so we see in the New Testament, we see another example of this. So let's turn forward to Ephesians chapter 6, and let us understand how this, how this honour, this respect that is expected within the family is, actually, is in fact a two-way street. Ephesians 6, and we'll start in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Master, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may go beautifully for you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, parents, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the master. So here we see, and this is a, a scripture that in many homes is read on a Rev Shabbat. 
it's part of the family blessing that is that is shared in, in many many families and here we see in verse 4 it says and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of Yehovah. So just as the parent has, has a scriptural and a biblical right to demand and to expect the respect of their children, the parents also have an obligation, they have a, uh, a direct corollary that the parents are not to provoke their children to wrath. The parents are to nurture the children, the parents are to protect the children, the parents are to bring them up and to raise them in the admonition of Jehovah so that they may learn the lesson. This extension of life, so that long may be your days on the earth, comes from the children learning Torah, learning how to live a godly lifestyle, learning how to be uh, acceptable in the eyes of Jehovah so that they will come under his protection and they will receive his blessings. And when the family unit fails and that respect between parent and child is lost, then the whole, the whole social structure starts to unravel. And just as we see the requirement on the parents to nurture their children, there is a what I would consider to be a self-regulating commandment. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 21 and let us understand this other instruction in the Torah and how we are to apply that. Deuteronomy 21 and we'll start in verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and who when they have chastened him will not heed them then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elders of the city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. So in verses 18 and 19 it says this, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him he will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, bring him out to the elders of the city, and unto the gate of his place. And then, as we saw in, in the last verse, that they were stoned to death. Now that is a tough statement. And that is as much a condemnation of the parents as it is on the child. The, the child would become rebellious and stubborn because of the failure of the parents. And there's a saying that no parent should ever have to see their own child buried. And for a parent to have to bring a child out to, to face the death penalty because of the failure of them as parents is why this is one of those self-regulating commandments. If we had done the right thing, if the parents had lived according to Torah, if the parents had raised their children correctly, the child would not have been rebellious and indolent, and the parents would not have to go through the, the pain of having to bring their own children to face the death penalty. So again, we see that as, as we have given up on the Torah and given up on the law, it has a profound damaging effect on all members of the family. And we need to understand how this affects us and how this affects our society because we have done away with this law. Now as I said, the, the fifth commandment is a transitional commandment and we've, we've looked at the physical instruction how we are to respect our earthly parents, how our earthly parents are to bring us up in the training and admonition of Jehovah, how if the parents fail their children will suffer suffer loss and even even suffer death. And as we know from previous studies, the, the actions and the behavior and the events that happen to physical Israel are also uh, a foundation, they're a basis for our understanding of the spiritual nature of our relationship with Jehovah. We said that the fifth commandment was transitional, so we've seen the physical manifestation of that commandment in the relation between the, the earthly parent and the earthly children. Now let's look at the spiritual manifestation in the relationship between 
us as the children and Yehovah as our Father. So let's turn to Matthew 10. And we'll go to Matthew chapter 10 and we will start in verse 27. Matthew 10, starting in verse 27. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the air, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, who confess, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies shall be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his stake and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So is Jehoshua breaking Torah? He's telling us that his ministry will set father against son, mother against daughter, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. Is Jehoshua here breaking Torah? Well, no, Jehoshua here is telling us the inevitable, that when people step out of social norms, when people step out of the family model, it causes conflict. I know when we came into the understanding of the Sabbath day and the understanding of the feast days, when we turned away from the Church of England and the, and the Anglican Church of Canada, it caused great disruption within our family to the point where my parents effectively disowned me, they would have nothing to do with us, and it was a, a time of great pain and stress within our family. Um, but we had to make a choice. We had to choose to either follow the earthly tradition of our earthly parents or to follow the will of Jehovah, our Heavenly Father, and do His will. And so we chose to follow the way of Jehovah. And over time, the, the rift within our family has healed to some extent. Um, but still, the, the scripture that, that Jehovah raised here was exactly fulfilled within our family as we chose to go away from the the standards and the norms of that family and go after the way of Jehovah, it caused disruption and division and pain within our family unit. But Jehoshua is in fact not um, not causing us to to break Torah. Jehoshua is actually stating a, a matter of fact and in verses 36 to 37 it says and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So Yehoshua is not telling us to disrespect our parents. Yehoshua is not telling us to, to ignore the commandment. But Yehoshua is telling us that we, we need to put the law of Yehovah. We need to put our desire and our adoration and our love of Jehovah first, if that can be accomplished within the reference of, of the love of our earthly family, then great. But if not, we have, if, we have, if we are forced into a position where we have to choose between Jehovah and our family, we are required as children of Jehovah to choose him and to turn away from our earthly family. So let's continue in that thought. Let's turn forward just a few pages to Matthew 23. And let us look at a couple more, a couple more verses in, in this light. Matthew 23 and verse 1. Then Jehoshua spoke to the, to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you, observe, and that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. 
but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad, and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you, do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Messiah, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on the earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teacher, for one is your teacher, the Messiah. But he who is greatest among you shall, shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, what do we see here? Well, in verse 9 it says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So here Yehoshua is telling us that we need to grow. As we grow physically and we grow to spiritual maturity, we need to be looking to Yehovah, our Heavenly Father, for guidance, for admonition, for education, for wisdom. And we need to grow and surpass our earthly fathers who may be limited because they have not come into that relationship with him. So we are not to call any man on earth father in the way that we would look to Yehovah as our Heavenly Father. And that gives us a, a, a good understanding of some of the hubris and the arrogance of the, of the earthly church, of the man-made churches. I mean, certainly the, the, common, the common term for a minister within the Catholic Church is that of Father. But here there is an explicit scripture that says, Call no man Father. So we see how the Catholic Church has interposed itself between the people and, and Yehovah. They have set themselves up, and indeed the, the formal title of the Pope is the Vicar of Christ, the vicarious presence of Christ. The Pope stands in place of Yehoshua. So we see the arrogance and we see the hubris of that man-made organization. But we are not to call anyone on earth Father. We are to reach out to our Heavenly Father and turn to Him for His wisdom and His guidance and His succor and his support. And Yehoshua himself clearly represented this in his life. So let's turn forward again just a couple of pages, this time to Luke chapter 2, and let us understand how Yehoshua himself physically fulfilled this requirement. Luke 2, and we'll start in verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year for the feast of the Passover. And when he was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Yehoshua lingered behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now so it was that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. So here Yehoshua, at the age of 12, when he was passing from childhood into adolescence, was also maturing spiritually so that he was no longer looking to Joseph, his surrogate earthly father, but he was looking to his heavenly father. And in verse 49 it says, and he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? So Yehoshua was revealing to them that as part of this maturing, as part of this growing process, we put off the wisdom of our earthly fathers, but we take on the wisdom of our heavenly father so that we can grow in grace and knowledge, so that we can grow from, spirit, from physical beings to spiritual beings, and we can grow and prepare ourselves for the blessing that Yehovah has for those who call 
him father and let us understand what that blessing truly is and let us understand the end state that Yehovah has offered to all people who choose to call him father let's turn forward to the book of Romans let us go to Romans chapter 8 and we'll start in verse 12 Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, these are the sons of the Mighty One. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of the Mighty One. And if children, then heirs, heirs of the Mighty One, and joint heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of the Mighty One. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of the Mighty One. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of the Mighty One. And we know that all good things work together for good to those who love the Mighty One, for those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined, to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be, be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So in verse, in verse 14, Paul tells us this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, they are the sons of the Mighty One. So we can see that as we mature, as we no longer look to our earthly Father for wisdom and guidance, but we start to look to our Heavenly Father, we become His sons. It says, as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One are the sons of the Mighty One. We come into this relationship with our Heavenly Father. Just as we have learned from our earthly father, we now mature into a spiritual being and we learn, from, we learn the lessons from our heavenly father, from our spiritual father. And when we learn his lessons, when we do his will, we are numbered as his children, as his sons. And the blessing that he has for his sons is how this fulfillment of the fifth commandment, that long may be your days on the earth, when we understand that when we come into this relationship with Yehovah, we receive his blessings, both physically and spiritually. And we receive not only physical protection, physical wealth, physical abundance, but we ultimately also receive eternal life. So let's look at another scripture that backs up this concept. Let's turn forward again just a few pages to Galatians. We'll go to Galatians chapter 4 and we'll start in verse 1. Galatians 4, starting in verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, 
does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards and until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time has come, the Mighty One sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, the Mighty One has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of the Mighty One through Messiah. So in verse 7 it says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of the Mighty One, through Messiah. As we mature, as we come to understand physical lessons, we are able to understand spiritual lessons. We come into a spiritual relationship with our Heavenly Father, we become adopted as His sons, and we become an heir to the family of Jehovah. Just as Yehoshua is the only begotten son of Yehovah, we become fully-fledged members of that family, and we receive all the blessings that that entails. So let's look forward to what this blessing actually is. Let's turn to the book of Revelation and let us understand how this blessing will be manifest in the time of the end. Revelation 21, and we'll start in verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, but there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the set-apart city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from the Mighty One, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of the Mighty One is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. The Mighty One himself will be with them and be their Mighty One. And the Mighty One will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his mighty one, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire, and brimstone, which is the second death. So in verse 7 it says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his mighty one, and he shall be my son. When we overcome all things, when we overcome our carnal nature, when we overcome the cares of the world, when we overcome our spiritual limitations, our spiritual maturity, we will come into that ultimate relationship with Jehovah. We will be called his son, and as his son, we will inherit everything that our Heavenly Father has prepared for us, which includes eternal life, which includes being numbered as a king of kings and ruler of all, to be alongside Jehoshua in the time of the end. And this is where obedience to the fifth commandment, learning the lesson from our earthly father, and then taking that lesson forward to learn the lesson from our Heavenly Father and entering into that relationship and ultimately receiving sonship is where this commandment pays off that blessing that long may be your days on the earth and that you will be blessed when you enter into that ultimately re relationship with Jehovah your Father. So let's bring this message to a close. Let's turn to 1 John. We'll turn to the first epistle of John chapter 5, and we'll start in verse 9. 1 John 5, starting in verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, 
The witness of the Mighty One is greater, for this is the witness of the Mighty One, which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of the Mighty One has a witness in himself. He who does not believe the Mighty One has made him a liar, because he has not believed the testimony that the Mighty One has given of his Son. And this is the testimony, that the Mighty One has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of the Mighty One does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of the Mighty One, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of the Mighty One. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that this that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. We know that whoever is born of the Mighty One does not sin, but he who has been born of the Mighty One keeps himself, and the Wicked One does not touch him. We know that we are of the Mighty One, and the whole world lies under the sway of the Wicked One. And we know that the Son of the Mighty One has come and given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Yehoshua Messiah. This is the true Mighty One and eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So in verse 11, it tells us how the blessing of the fifth commandment is ultimately manifest. It says, and this is the record that the mighty one hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. When we ultimately become children of Jehovah, children of the eternal mighty one, of the eternal heavenly Father, when we become his sons, we receive eternal life, and the ultimate blessing of the fifth commandment is fulfilled in this manner. And just as we are required to obey our earthly fathers, and just as we, we grow in grace and knowledge to learn to have that relationship with Jehovah, in, in the beginning of this chapter, it tells us this. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, we're told this. Whoever believes that Yehoshua is the Messiah is born of the Mighty One, and everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of the Mighty One, when we love the Mighty One and keep his commandments. For this is the love of the Mighty One, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of the Mighty One overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Yehoshua is the Son of the Mighty One. So brethren, just as we saw in the book of Revelation, he who overcomes shall inherit all things. What do we overcome? We overcome the world. And as it says in verses 2 and 3, when we overcome the world, we do the will of our Father, which is this. By this we know that we love the children of the Mighty One, when we love the Mighty One, and keep his commandments. For this is the love of the Mighty One, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So brethren, let us go forth to honor our father and our mother. Let us go forth to grow in grace and knowledge, to honor our heavenly father, to receive the blessing that comes from being called his son, to be adopted into sonship with Yehoshua, that we may ultimately receive eternal life. Amen.